So you have a, uh, a very strong leadership. Uh, I mean, those five characteristics, they all make a strong team. And you said if, if there's somebody wrong or somebody that's going against that, you get rid of them. How, how do you deal with like a poison in your company that, I mean, if you don't get them at the very beginning, that has already started spreading to uh, some of the workers? And do you just hit the root? Do you hit all the people? That's a great, great question. You know, when I gave my talk at Quantico, the, uh, the general who invited me got all pumped up and started talking about Iwo Jima and all this stuff. He grabbed a microphone and he says, Tom, one last question. How do you motivate an unmotivated person? I said, I fire her. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I always start at the top. Don't go bottoms up. If I have an organization that seems broken, I look at the leader of that organization. I don't look at the people under them. The people under them may be better than you think. You don't know until you find a different leader. How many times have you seen a sports team take out somebody, put a new leader in that same team that was supposedly not good, different people rise up? I think a lot of organizations do this wrong. They penalize the people at the bottom first for non-performance when really the person leading them is not doing the job. But make sure the leadership is doing the right thing, right? Number one, number two is I would definitely address it in some fashion. Though. And I would make sure they know it's unacceptable. And I'd make sure they knew in no certain terms what the action was going to be if they didn't fix it. You can't fire them, but you can certainly isolate them. If, you know why? Because it's important the rest of the team knows you're doing it. I had a guy, I gave a talk in... Uh, in Pebble Beach, California recently for a company called CSC. And one of the gentlemen asked me to speak later. He runs a company that had not done business with before, now does. Uh, but anyway, he came to me and said, I got a guy, he's my number two guy. And he is incredibly good at delivering things on time. So he's efficient. But people hate him. People work for him, hate him. His peers hate him. He doesn't show to meetings unless he feels like it's in, or, or, it just makes his own decision. I'm not coming to that meeting. He doesn't interact with anybody. He doesn't care what they think. What would you do? I said, I'd take him out of that job tomorrow. Really? Yeah. You have to fire him, but I wouldn't leave him in that job. They said, because when you have someone like a Terrell Owens play for your team and you make that acceptable, how do you tell the other people that's not acceptable? You just lowered the bar. This is your number two guy, and he makes his own set of rules. Why do I have to follow rules? Guy called me up two weeks later, took him out the next day, put him, made him an individual contributor as opposed to a leader. The guy's thrilled. The other guy is happier now because he didn't really like the job, it turns out. <laughs> but the rest of the company looks at him differently. If you don't take an action, they look at you because they know. When you have someone who absolutely is not performing and doesn't care, the other people around them know. And you know what? That usually means they have to do more to cover for that person. You have to take an action to make that person perform or to get them out of the way, so that the other people know that you really are leading. Otherwise, it's a direct reflection on the leader, I guarantee you. If you don't take an action, people look at you differently. You know, when I make my calls, no one, take, no one keeps it a secret that I call it, no one. You know why? People emulate the behavior you recognize. We were chatting about what you do here. It's very important to role models we pick. It's critical who you give awards to, and it's critical what you award them for. You just told everybody what behavior you're looking for. So when I call these people, the first question others ask them is, why do he call you? I want them to know why he called you. Because I want people to copy that behavior. So you said uh, you started out on that app with 35 people. Or I was a 32nd person. OK, somewhere around that number. Um, when we graduate, we're going to have platoons around that same number. So I just wanted to know uh, how you develop those individuals to achieve your organizational goals and how you also pick those individuals because we won't have the opportunity to handpick who's going to be in our team. Yeah, that's, that's true. So when, when I got to the company, almost everybody was an engineer. So I was brought in to set up the sales part of our business. Now we're going to go to market. They had a product. Those 30-some people, or probably 28 of them, designed the product over two years. First thing I did, so I lived in Dallas, Texas. company was in Northern California. I, they work different hours than most human beings. Engineers are odd, period. But you know what I did? I adjusted my hours to be there when they were there. So they were there all night. And they would typically come in around 10 or 11. I came in early, but I still was there. And I played ping pong with most of the engineers from about 2 to 4. Now, why do I bring that up? Because that made me bond with them around something they liked to do. And so years and years and years later, when I needed something, if I asked them to do it, they would do it. Because they knew me. They're 
in your opinion, is it the mission that matter or the means that you do in order to accomplish the mission? Well, I certainly don't think accomplishing a mission by means you wouldn't be proud of it is the way to go. I do think too. It's important to be creative about how you go about completing the mission. So I do think you have to say, what are we trying to accomplish? What is it? And if you can't define that, you can't do it. So mission first does make sense to me. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Lou Holtz is a friend of mine, he's a former football coach. He said, no one's ever climbed Mount Everest. Scott just said, how did I get here? <laughs> that was the mission, to get to the top of Mount Everest. Now, with that said, I think what they're Having looked at your curriculum here, it's very important to you that you get there in a way you're going to be proud of. I mean, you look at the, the situation in Iraq and Fallujah and all those kinds of things, the situations the soldiers found themselves in. It's very important that they accomplish a mission, but it's very important they do it in a way that we're proud of them and the, and the people around them feel like they were treated with respect. What kind of generally led you to come up with the things that you decided are important to you? Our, if our CEO is here, he just retired, we, uh, we promoted with him, but he always talks about values. And the reason I don't talk about values, I never know what they are unless I go read them on the wall again. <laughs> Nor does anybody else that I know. It's, it's amazing because you, you rattled off like seven, I, I can't do that to him. So I, I started to say to myself, what is the behavior that I want to see common among our team? Sure, values are things I treat people well. You know, everybody, every, until the Hun probably said, people are my most important asset. In this case, you might have meant it, by the way. Might have it. But the fact of the matter is, those things are common behaviors that I want to see cross-culturally, that if they do those, we're going to be okay. So I defined them myself. I added to embracing change years after I did the first four. Because when we really hit the wall, when, when the market crashed on us, I realized that, I, I had a number of people saying to me, when are we going to quit changing your own life? We're thinking about this wrong. We're thinking about this wrong. We're, we're very fortunate. Our chairman of our company is a guy named Don Valentine. Don's the most famous venture capitalist ever. He started venture capital in Silicon Valley. So he has funded Yahoo. Well, he started Cisco. He funded Cisco. He funded Apple. He funded Oracle. He funded Yahoo. He funded eBay. He currently owns 15%. Him and his seven partners are Google. Touchdown! <laughs> so, so he's, he's the guy. He's our chairman of the board. And early on in NetApp days, we started a takeoff and the sales were going like this. And in the early days of a company, when you're not on target, they want to know the sales guy real well. So I was at every board meeting. And then when we started to explode, they didn't ask me to come back. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. And then one day they called me and they said, Don would like you to come to the board meeting. And I thought it was going to be like one of those old Roman movies, you know, where the guy comes in, they all throw stuff, flowers and stuff, you know, that's there. Well, it didn't go that way. So I showed up, and, and our CEO hands me a slide. So why don't you start off with this slide? Okay, I don't care. I know what my numbers are great. What are they going to say? And he annihilated me in this meeting for 30 minutes. Just made it unbelievably uncomfortable. What's that deferred revenue call? So I, I don't know. So you always put slides up, you don't know what you're talking about? <laughs> what am I going to say? He gave it to me. He said, hey, the CEO. It never got better. 30 minutes later, I am furious because I'm waiting for them to ask me how the numbers. Numbers like that. The meeting ends. I mean, I never got to the numbers. I'm outside. I am really pissed off. And the, the number two guy at Sequoia Capital, which is Dodd's company, who now is the number one guy named Doug the only, says, you didn't like the way that meeting went, did you? I said, no, I didn't like the way that meeting went. And he goes, why do you think Don did that? I have no idea why Don did that. He said, you know when your, your numbers are struggling at the beginning, how did Don act toward you personally? I said, actually, he was pretty nice to me, supportive. What could I do? Why are we losing? Do you understand the issues? Is there anything you can be doing differently? No. Good. Keep doing it. Now, now you've exploded the numbers. How did Don react? He's all over me. He said, that's right, because he believes the number one killer of companies is complacency. I'm one. That's a great lesson. When times are tough, you gotta support people. And when times are good, you gotta make them uncomfortable. You gotta push them. Can't let them be complacent. 